let's start with the headlines. Indian markets fell sharply, mirroring losses in global equity markets after concerns grew that global growth could be hit amid escalation of ongoing trade war. Tata Steel moves an inch closer to taking over Bhushan Steel with the Committee of Lenders approving its bid. Five states will elect their representatives to the Rajya Sabha today, giving the ruling BJP an opportunity to increase its tally in the upper house of parliament. Donald Trump triggers a trade war between the U.S. and China by imposing trade barriers on goods worth $50 billion. The Asian nation retaliates by hiking import duty on select U.S. products. Well, first up, the markets, the Indian markets were also spooked by those fears. Uh, the handover from U.S. definitely was negative. The Asian and the European markets today open weak. But back home in India, we saw cuts of over 1% coming about. Let's go across to Neeraj Shah, who's standing by to take us through all the trading activity of today and for the week. Neeraj. Well, it was, an, uh, it was a messy Friday, if I can use that term. Uh, and it did uh, prepare any kind of hopes that people may have had for recoveries because that led to the markets falling about a couple of percentage points. Uh, the benchmark indices, at least the Nifty Bank, maybe more, and the mid caps and the small caps for the week, at least, uh, uh, didn't do too well. So 4.5% for the small cap space, which bore the brunt of selling pressure this week. Uh, let's quickly tell you what led to this fall. Commodities by and large came off. Vedanta, Hindalco, Tata Steel, at the broad end of the spectrum, JSPL, Steel, all of these stocks came off. Uh, oil marketing companies, BPHP, IOC, IOC and BPCL in particular, had some serious uh, gashes uh, this week, <coughs> blame it on crude or otherwise. And then banks, uh, don't forget them, SBI, Yes Bank, ICICI Bank. In fact, in terms of heavyweights, SBI and ICICI Bank were probably the ones that contributed the most uh, to this uh, fall as well. But Yes Bank, 8.5%, not the best of days. And NTPC, defensive nature, bucked the trend a little bit, up about 3%. It was nice to see some green on the screen as well. And what also bucked the trend at the broader end of the spectrum, or the Nifty 500, the BSE 500, was stocks like Crompton Greaves Consumer, which was up about 6.5%, while the other indices didn't do so. But those were few and far in between. It was a list of losers. So banks, um, once again, at the fore, Union, Central Bank, Canada Bank, IDBI Bank, this whole clutch of names fell and fell on fairly heavy trading and cash market volumes as well. So there's a lot of trading activity, both in futures and the cash market on these stocks. Power companies had a a decimal outing. Adani power down 11%, Torrent power down about 10 or 11% as well. Didn't have a great uh, week. And uh, I mean, throughout the week, they were selling. It was not just one big day. Uh, impact of cheaper pizzas, maybe. The shareholders are definitely smiling, even with the pizzas being cheaper, as are the customers. Jubilant Food Works ending up 8% for the week gone by. A clutch of other consumption names also did well. But this one kind of stood out in trade. But all in all, a forgetful week. Uh, but the way the global markets are behaving, we may not have a very pleasant week, the next one as well. One just hopes it's not as bad as the one gone by. Thanks, Neeraj, for bringing all those details. But it's Friday. You can go and enjoy your pizza now. But let's move on. President Donald Trump announced 25% tariffs on Chinese imports worth at least $50 billion. And the products range from aerospace and machinery to information and communication. Technology as well. Trump also plans new investment restrictions on Chinese companies. This is the first of many trade actions Trump promised while criticizing China for intellectual property theft worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Listen in. With China, we're going to be doing a Section 301 trade action. It could be about $60 billion. But that's really just a fraction of what we're talking about. And in retaliation to President Trump's tariffs, China has announced plans for reciprocal tariffs on $3 billion worth of imports from the U.S. Products range from steel to pork. Bloomberg's Tom has the report. Well, it seems like it's a shot across the brow from China rather than a punch to the gut because 3 billion versus the 50 or 60 billion that Trump is looking at is obviously uh, a big difference between those two numbers. And they're looking at, what, 25% tariffs on steel and on pork. 25% on pork, I should say, 15% on steel, 15% on wine and fruit. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a warning shot at this stage from China. Look, China said, and it's put out statements this morning, whether that's from the ambassador in the US, 
US or the Commerce Ministry more recently saying that they're not afraid of a trade war and that they'll fight it to the end, essentially, is what the ambassador said. But also, clearly, China's policymakers and China's corporate leaders really do want to avoid a trade war. So I would say suggest, uh, I would suggest that China is going to take a pretty measured, strategic approach in terms of, of its response, in terms of reciprocal measures uh, to what's coming out of Washington. No, there are other measures, clearly, that they can take. They've got plenty of other firepower, whether that's taking overt measures, just putting stumbling blocks in place for U.S. companies operating on the ground here in China, or making it uh, more difficult to import, for example, U.S. soybeans. Of course, China pulls in about a third of all the soybeans exported from the U.S., worth about 15 uh, billion U.S. dollars. And they have plenty, other, plenty of other tools at their disposal. But for the moment, this is going to be probably a measured response from a Chinese uh, government that wants to focus more domestically on some of the pressing issues here at home. While moving ahead, Nobel laureate and noted information economist Joseph Stieglitz thinks that China is in a better place to withstand the storm that the U.S. if a full if a full blown trade war unfolds. He also says that China will not want to be seen as weak as uh, weak on trade against a bully like U.S. President Donald Trump. China cannot be seen to be weak. Uh, and particularly when you have a bully like Trump, uh, it would uh, uh, not be good to respond in a weak way because what happens is we know about appeasement uh, from Munich. Uh, it's a different kind of a war, but in a trade war, appeasement could lead to more and more demands. Well, Cornell University professor of trade policy Iswe Prasad believes that these tariffs will lead to escalating tensions between two countries, while J.P. Morgan's Jahangir Aziz warns that the total value of the goods included under U.S. import tariffs could be much larger than $50 billion. Well, after a long period of saber rattling, finally the swords have been unsheathed. And it's clear that this is going to lead to escalating tensions between the two countries. But the Chinese side, uh, for its part, has uh, responded with some harsh rhetoric. But also the Chinese seem to be trying to play the uh, sensible grown-ups in the room. They've threatened some degree of retaliation, but not a very broad-based retaliation as yet. I think they're waiting to see what actions precisely the Trump administration takes, because there is still a waiting period where the uh, administration says it will get uh, consultations uh, with businesses uh, going and also try to work through the WTO process. There are legitimate concerns that the U.S. Uh, administration has and that previous administrations have had as well. The fact that China does not have a sound intellectual property rights regime uh, uh, in place, that uh, they do restrict market access, uh, access to their markets, that is, to um, uh, imports from the U.S. They make it somewhat difficult for American firms to operate in the Chinese market. Um, but there are ways to get around this uh, that I think would be far better than a unilateral measure to uh, strike at China using tariffs. If you look at the actual USTR report, it says that it will announce a thousand odd items uh, on which the 25% ad valorem tar uh, tariff will be imposed. Uh, we don't know uh, what those 1,000 odd items are going to be. And if you add up all the 1,000 odd items at the value of that, it may be more than $50 billion. If the impact is only on $50 billion of Chinese exports, uh, then I think the impact is going to be modest, about 0.1% of GDP or thereabouts on Chinese growth, and maybe a little bit more in terms of spillover into Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, and Vietnam. Well, India's Sherpa at G20, Shaktikanta Das, is worried of the implications that the move could have on the recovery in global growth. In conversation with Bloomberg Quinn's Menika Doshi, he said compared to countries like China, the Indian industry is a bit insulated as the exports to U.S. from India are far less. Listen in. Over the past uh, several years, global growth has been supported and sustained by uh, international trade. Now, when the international trade volumes were rising, global growth also benefited out of that. 
So if there is a contraction in international trade due to a contraction in demand, which we saw in the last few years, obviously global growth had slowed down. Now global growth is showing signs of recovery and IMF has given its projections. So this kind of trade war, if it ultimately breaks out, it is obviously a matter of concern for sustenance of the revival of global growth which is now visible. That's the first point I would like to mention. Second thing is with regard to aluminium and uh, steel where uh, U.S. has imposed certain tariffs, I think our share of uh, total import to U.S., or rather, let me put it this way, out of India's total exports, I mean, a very small percentage is exported to U.S., so therefore it may not affect our industry much. And uh, so therefore, to that extent, we are somewhat insulated compared to countries like uh, China and uh, others. And uh, now this kind of tariff and uh, the countermeasures being taken by China, I think there are certain trade issues uh, emanating from the fact that U.S. has a huge uh, trade deficit with uh, China. I think one would expect both being responsible, one would expect both countries to sort of bilaterally discuss their mutual issues and uh, sort it out. And uh, I think that should be the roadmap uh, for the future, because if you if it leads to a kind of unbridled, uh, you know, tariff measures, then obviously it's not good news for the world, not good news for these individual countries also, because, you know, somewhere their downstream industries will also face the heat. I mean, when you in improve, you know, when you sort of increase the tariff on certain products, you have a set of downstream industries which use that as a intermediate product or as a raw material. So I think both China and U.S. will have to look at, uh, you know, the how it affects the downstream industries. And I think in, uh, domestically also their downstream industries will put forth their point of view. So therefore, it's very important to keep a close watch. Well, if there is someone who can breathe a sigh of relief from the whole U.S.-China trade tensions is Theresa May, who is under pressure over Brexit talks. The U.K. Prime Minister has said that the temporary exemption granted to European Union and some other countries, including the U.K., is a step in the right direction. She also said she is in talks with the other leaders of European Union to make the exemptions permanent. We've been working very hard to secure an EU-wide exemption to the steel tariffs that the Americans have announced. I'm pleased that they've announced a temporary exemption for the EU. What I'll be working with my fellow EU leaders today on is to see how we can secure a permanent exemption for the EU for those uh, steel tariffs, and we'll be talking about what the next steps might be. All right, back home in India, Rajya Sabha elections are underway and it's a high-intensity battle where every vote counts, especially from the state of Uttar Pradesh. BJP is assured of 8 out of 10 Rajya Sabha seats, where Samajpadi Party assured of one seat. The 10th seat is the one in which there is a stiff fight. One BSP MLA said that he cross-voted to BJP, while the Samajwadi, the Bahujan Samaj Party, and Congress combined is banking heavily on two independent votes to secure the election of PSP candidate. So why are these Rajya Sabha polls so important for the BJP and the other parties and what implication would it have on the 2019 elections? Kaushik Vaidya explains just that in this report. In any government, in the last one where Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was a Rajya Sabha member, to this one where senior ministers like uh, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley, uh, Defence Minister Nirmala Sitharaman, um, the previous Defence Minister when, before he went back to Goa, Manohar Parikkar, Suresh Prabhu, are all Rajya Sabha members. Mm. So from time to time they need to get re-elected uh, from particular states. Mm. The BJP began its government with the biggest majority in the Lok Sabha in 30 years, mm. but at a distinct disadvantage in the Rajya Sabha. Why so? Because it had been ruling in only five or six states in the country at that point in 2014, mm -hmm. and it's taken that state-by-state -state sweep that the party enjoyed over the last four years to turn the Rajya Sabha math incrementally slowly at a time. Mm. Because remember, it happened in a two-year rolling cycle. Right. That's allowed the BJP only last year to get to 58 at the largest party in the Rajya Sabha. Mm. Uh, that's how fragmented this house is. At 58, 
48 out of 245 and that's the largest party. Mm. The halfway mark with 233 voting members mm. is about 117, 118. So even at the largest party point, it's still a distance away mm. from anywhere close to a majority, so to speak, mm. in the Rajya Sabha, something parties that have ruled at the centre haven't enjoyed. Mm. We've had legislation stuck in the past before, like the land bill, which eventually via an ordinance and then removed, mm. uh, that the BJP has not been able to get passed. Mm. So incrementally, this is the last step before the last general election, uh, the next general election, to get those Rajya Sabha numbers higher. Uttar Pradesh you spoke of, Karnataka is one where the Congress is ruling and that's where one open seat is, is in contention and there's one in Jharkhand. Mm. Uh, elsewhere, you have a number of candidates like Arun Jaitley in Uttar Pradesh who will go through because those numbers are there to back them. Okay. Uh, there's been some reports of cross-voting in, in one of those seats in Uttar Pradesh. That's right. So, uh, there, there, is, there have been a few uh, Hindi media reports who have said to have spoken to a particular few MLAs that, that say that they will cross-vote. Now, that this is an open ballot system and we'll know once these votes are tallied who's voted where. Mm. Uh, the, the numbers in that Uttar Pradesh one, Hasha, are very, very interesting. Mm. Uh, you have eight candidates for the BGP that will go through. For the ninth candidate that the BGP has put up, mm. uh, it is short by about seven votes. Mm. The SP, BSP combined, using the B, the Samajwadi party's what are called surplus votes, mm. that gets them to about two short. Mm. So the Samajwadi, BSP, Congress combination mm. needs to find two votes between independents or elsewhere. Mm. The BJP needs to find seven cross-voting votes. Mm. Uh, this will go down probably to the last MLA and who votes which way, mm. uh, which we'll know later this evening. Meanwhile, voting for five Rajya Sabha seats from West Bengal is also underway. A candidate requires 49 votes to win a Rajya Sabha seat from the state. Trinamool Congress has fielded four candidates and announced support to Congress candidate Abhishek Manu Singhvi in the fifth. Left Front, which has 30 seats, are fighting Congress in the fifth seat. Voting for the lone Rajya Sabha seat in Kerala is underway, where Janata Dal's united candidate, who is backed by Left Front, is set to win. BJP and Congress, meanwhile, are also set to share the two seats up for grabs in the state of Jharkhand. And moving on, Bhushan Steel may be the first of the insolvent accounts to be resolved. The steelmakers' lenders have approved Tata Steel's resolution plan. Bloomberg reports that Tata Steel offered 35,000 crore rupees, nearly $5.3 billion to lenders to acquire the debt laden Bhushan Steel. Well, in a statement, Tata Steel said it has been declared the successful resolution applicant by the Committee of Creditors of Bhushan Steel, subject to approval from NCLT and also competition. Commission of India. Tata Steel also said it has accepted the letter of intent for Bhushan Steel under the corporate insolvency resolution process of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. The acquisition will help Tata Steel accelerate its plan to double capacity to 26 million tons in the next five years. Bhushan Steel has a production capacity of 5.6 million tons of metal a year. Well, the telecom regulator has released subscriber data for the month of January. And the winner once again is Reliance Geo, that too with a huge margin. The new entrant has added double the numbers of subscribers as compared to all its rivals put together. Somit Sarkar breaks down the numbers in this report. So Reliance Geo has added close to 83 lakh customers in the month of January as compared to 39 lakh customers added by Bharti Airtel, Idea Cellular and Vodafone India combined. Now this is according to the latest release by the TRI. However, on a net basis, if you see the telecom sector has lost close to 1.5 crore subscribers. This is because of the fall in multi-SIM users or SIM consolidation as we know it. So the SIM consolidation taking place because of the, uh, because of the, because of the consolidation in the service provider space and because of the cheap bundle plans offered by the mobile service provider. For Reliance Geo, it was its best performance in the last 11 months when it comes to subscriber additions. In fact, in the subscriber addition for Reliance Geo has been increasing pace. Now, in the, la in the last month, it added close to 80 lakh subscribers and in the month of January, it added 83 lakh subscribers. Now, this could be because of lower tariffs and because of the Geo phone launched by the company. Uh, among the smaller operators, if you see, other than BSL, none of the other operators were able to add any more customers. Reliance Communication, Tata Teleservices, Aircel, MTNL, and Telenor lost close to around 2.8 crore subscribers in the month of January. 
and going forward this pressure on customer addition and some consolidation is expected to continue because the players who are at a verge of exiting the telecom industry currently hold around 15% of the total subscriber base. Lastly, in terms of market share, if you see other than uh, Reliance Geo, market share has increased the most that is by around 90 basis points while that of other players like Bharti Airtel, Idea Cellular and Vodafone India has increased in the range of 30 to 45 basis points in the month of January. Well, the Delhi High Court today granted bail to P. Chidambaram's son, Karthi Chidambaram. This is in connection with INX Media case. The court also said that while out on bail, Karthi will not tamper with any evidence in this case. Karthi was arrested on February 28th by the CBI on his return from the United Kingdom. And his 12-day judicial custody in the case would have expired tomorrow. While well, both houses of parliament were adjourned for the 15th day, a stalemate between the government and the opposition continued. Well, it's, it has been a week since the no confidence motion has not been taken up in the lower house. Due to protest by opposition parties, Speaker Sumitra Mahajan had last Friday announced that she had received two notices for the motion but was unable to start the process due to the disruptions. The Rajya Sabha could not transact any business as well and adjourned within 20 minutes of assembly as opposition parties continued to create ruckus. This is the third straight week that both the houses were adjourned without undertaking any significant business barring the finance bill in the Lok Sabha. This budget session is a very long time. So, we are talking about all the things. We are talking about the ADMK and TRS. We have talked about the ADMK and TRS. And we have talked about it. गतिरोध समाप्त करने के लिए हम तो हमारे सीट में बैठे हैं आप लोकसभा में देखिए कांग्रेस तो दस दिन से उठा भी नहीं उनके सीट से जब तक स्पीकर ने नहीं बोला कि हम नो कॉन्फ्रेंस मोशन कंसिडर करेंगे तब तो आप खड़े हो जाएं हम खड़े हो गए बट हम तो बोलते नहीं हम डिसेप्शन नहीं करें U.S. President Donald Trump is replacing White House National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster with John Bolton. While Bolton is a former U.S. Ambassador to United Nations, Trump's move comes just ahead of uh, planned talks with North Korean leader in the coming weeks. And as he faces a key decision in May on whether to maintain the Iran nuclear deal. Jody Schneider of Bloomberg News tells us the implications on the move in this report. Well, it seems that the president is replacing uh, the foreign policy moderates in his administration with people with much more hawkish views like John Bolton. Uh, former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, who he fired just a week ago, and, uh, and now Mr. McMaster, the national security advisor, were seen to have a more moderate stance on some of these foreign policy issues, sometimes at odds with the president. It seems now he wants loyalty and uh, he wants his views, which tend to be more right wing on foreign policy to be followed. Mr. Bolton is famously a hawk. Uh, he was uh, very uh, much in favor of the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003. And uh, as a, both at the UN and comments he's made more recently, he has been very hawkish. He said, for instance, that um, he thinks the uh, Iran nuclear agreement was a strategic debacle and had said fairly recently that he thought it would not be wrong for the U.S. necessarily to fire first with North Korea. Facebook's co-founder and chief executive officer Mark Zuckerberg has been called to appear before a House panel as fallout continues from revelations that data of millions of users was obtained by a political consulting firm linked to Donald, President Donald Trump. What would this mean for Facebook? Here's a special report. Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, to appear before it and answer some of the questions about the fallout from the data breach that's now been revealed. Millions of users' data was somehow exploited by a political consulting firm with ties to Donald Trump. We should point out that the CEO, Mark Zuckerberg's apology on CNN, an apology of sorts, uh, has not stopped critics. Take a listen. This was a major breach of trust, and, and I'm really sorry that this happened. Um, you know, we have a basic responsibility to protect people's data, and if we can't do that, then, then we don't uh, deserve to have the opportunity to serve people. 
Now, the stock, uh, which might have rebounded a bit with uh, the first steps that uh, Zuckerberg has taken in speaking out, uh, did not. It was its uh, fourth day lower in uh, uh, third day lower in four. Uh, there has been an enormous loss of uh, market value. There has been an 11 percent drop in the stock this week alone. Uh, the uh, lawmakers are now saying in Washington that CEO Zuckerberg has managed to do something that no one's been able to do with the current political climate in Washington, and that is he has united both Democrats and Republicans, both sides of the aisle, in outrage over what has happened. Uh, there is a demand clearly for more answers. There was a meeting between Facebook officials and some lawmakers uh, informally for two hours Wednesday. Uh, the word coming out of those meetings is that the lawmakers still don't understand completely what happened. Uh, the House Energy and Commerce Committee said in a statement Thursday, Zuckerberg is the right witness to provide answers to the American people, although there has been no specific date set for when he would speak. Well, with that, it's a wrap on this show, but there's lots more coming through the day. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to Bloomberg Quint.